Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us pray. Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 50, and I will read verse 4 through 9. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my eyes. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint. I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? Our next scripture reading is from Psalm chapter 31, verse 9 through 16. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Because of my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors, and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear many whispering, terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. 
I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. First, I'll begin the second readings with Philippians chapter 2, 
verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Next reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you be worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers in the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Lord Jesus knows that we are short on faith in God's goodness to us and long on anxiety, living as if there is no Father in heaven and we are all on our own. We are easily led astray into maximum anxiety over the things that we need to live. In Matthew 6, 25 to 34, Jesus gives us seven compelling arguments why we must believe in the goodness of God and not be overwhelmed with anxieties for the material things we need to stay alive. The first six compelling arguments for trusting in God's goodness and rejecting crippling anxiety we considered over the last two Sundays. First, because crippling anxiety destroys faith in God's goodness. Second compelling argument, because sustaining your life is more important to God than feeding the billions of birds that he feeds every day very successfully. The third compelling argument is because God provides protective clothing for your body is more important to him than the temporary dressing he provides for the beautiful flowers of the field. There's a fourth reason that worry has no power to add a single hour to your life. Fifth, because striving after material possessions is what pagans do, since all they know is in this world. And the sixth reason, because your Heavenly Father is well aware that you need food and clothing. Today we consider the 
Jesus' final compelling reason for trusting God and not succumbing to crippling anxiety. That seventh reason is because God promises to care for your needs if you will make his will your primary objective. All of those other six have led down to this one moment where Jesus says, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Make the main thing the main thing. Put first things first, and God will provide for your needs. What is the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Seek that first. What is it? The short answer is the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven. Make this the main thing in your life. Do you know why there is a telescopic scope on rifles? A scope narrows what you can see to a very small area, which it then enlarges within that area as the target that you want to hit. A scope also forces your eye to block out all distractions that are competing with your target. The kingdom of God and his righteousness is your primary target and anxiety distracts you from this target. So there are two ways to defeat worry. The first one is to seek first to belong to God's kingdom and to promote God's rule over all things. That's what it means. Seek first the kingdom of God. Worry is banished when God becomes the dominating power of your lives. When you concentrate on the kingdom of God, the cure for anxiety about our, about our material well-being is to seek first the rule of Jesus. Earlier in chapter 6, Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the first petition of the Lord's Supper. The first thing to ask for is the kingdom to come. When we put ourselves wholeheartedly under the rule of Jesus, we are seeking the kingdom of God. We ask, what's the will of God for me today? What about the rest of this afternoon? What about tonight? I'm committed to doing what is right in God's eyes as his will unfolds for me every day. Hard times, bitter times, always come. No one is exempt. Divorce, sexual abuse, murder, theft, betrayal, unspeakable crimes are always with us. There are many wicked people in this world. These are the result of sin in the world, and they will be with us till the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we are all gathered into his final kingdom where no evil can enter. I will be free from crippling anxiety when I am consciously seeking to come under the complete rule of Jesus Christ, my master. That is what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and is the first way to defeat crippling worry. The second way to defeat worry is to live one day at a time dedicated to doing what is right in my personal relationships and the work of my hands. Yes, I need to plan for tomorrow, but all of this text is about worrying yourself sick about what might happen. Jesus says, seek first to do God's, to be in God's kingdom. Second, to do what is right, what is the righteousness of God with the day that you have. We call that sanctification. Striving to love God with all we are and have, loving our neighbors ourselves. This is a life seeking to please Christ, a life free from harmful addictions, free from free from hatred, free to do good to all men, even to our enemies, free to bear the burdens of the afflicted, free to seek just treatment for the innocent and just punishment for the wicked. Christ promises in Matthew 6:33 that if we will pursue the rule of Christ over us and do what is right in God's eyes, our material needs will be supplied. That is the promise of Christ. It cannot fail. But maybe you're thinking, maybe Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe our Heavenly Father is not able to feed and clothe us in really bad times. And this is really bad time. People are losing businesses and millions are now jobless. Two of my three sons are suddenly unemployed. Is it still true 
that if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that God will take care of me? Yes, the promises of God are not contingent on a nation's economy. The promises of God are dependent on the power and the love of our heavenly father. What objective is worthy of your life? When you look through the scope of your ambitions, what is the focus? You may be a carpenter, a plumber, a preacher, a housewife, a teacher, a real estate owner, an administrator, a doctor, a clerk, a student. No one's left out. Are you seeking first in all your ambitions the kingdom of God and his righteousness? We must not worry about the unknown future and the things that may never come to pass. You have a heavenly father who created all these things and all things must obey him. We are freed from anxiety when we can say from our hearts that we are persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before there was a global positioning sat satellite, men found their way across oceans and continents by knowing the position of the stars. And chief among the stars is the North Star. All the objects of the heavens seem to revolve around the North Star that doesn't move in the night sky. It always sits in what we call the North. When sailors lost sight of the North Star, their paths became confused. They lost the direction in the vast oceans. As long as they could see the North Star, they could recover and they could see their destination. The kingdom of God and the righteousness of Christ is our North Star. I read a quote recently that said, a man is not a true Christian if his dog or cat is not the better for it. Are you a better man because you're a Christian? Are you a better wife, a better husband, father, mother, employee? Because you belong to Christ and you are seeking to be righteous, seek the righteousness of God in all the areas of your life. Jesus said that unless we seek first to be under his rule in all that we think and do, our lives will shipwreck for we have no worthy direction. Worthy, worry and crippling anxiety about tomorrow is cured when we seek to do the will of God in all aspects of our lives. Jesus concludes compelling arguments to trust in God's goodness and not give in to crippling worry with this reason. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and your heavenly father will supply all that you need. Tomorrow has always been in the hands of God and the will of God has already determined the final outcome of all diseases, plagues, cancers, earthquakes, poverty, sickness, death. You and I have no clue, but our Heavenly Father is already orchestrating tomorrow for the glory of Jesus Christ, before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So put your trust in the goodness of God and give up crippling worry. Let us pray. Merciful Father, help us to remember how big you are, even though we are tiny, and put our trust in you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our Lord Jesus gave us a great physical reminder of the once for all sacrifice of himself to satisfy divine justice. That reminder is the Lord's Supper. By the marvel of technology, while we are not under the same roof, we are together, sharing the word of God written, prayer, and now the Lord's Supper. I will set apart these elements by prayer and the word of institution as given in the scripture. But before I do that, let's do as we customarily do and repeat together the Apostles' Creed and then also the prayer of confession. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, O Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us confess our sins together using the apostle, using the prayer of confession in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, you wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I encourage you to take whatever elements you have at home, some bread, some juice, and serve one another. If you are alone at home, you are present with the rest of us now. Take the elements simultaneously as I offer them. If you're not alone, offer the bread to whoever's with you, saying, the body of Christ. Then offer the juice to each other and say, the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you do not dwell in a house made with the hands of man, and no church can contain your spirit. Visit us now as we gather as you told us, and make this bread and wine. That you love sinners. And there is no condemnation to those who love you. Amen. Hear now the gracious invitation of the Lord Jesus through his apostles. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread. And having given thanks, as I now do in his name, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for many unto the remission of sins. Drink, all of you, of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. How can we say thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west and given us eternal life? Come quickly, Lord Jesus and fill us with the great gifts of faith, hope, and love. Amen. As you remember the body of Christ today, I want you to remember particularly to pray for Brenda Cook, for Tiffany, her daughter, and for Joyce, her sister. They all live together, and two of them have the COVID virus. I don't know that Joyce does yet, and I hope she doesn't, but she has. she's on dialysis and very serious. Please remember them. Pray for Claudine Sordell. She works in the medical facility. Pray for Ray Johnson, who also has been in direct contact with patients who have the COVID. Pray for Karen Isles, who has been moved into the COVID wing of her hospital. Pray for Angie O'Dell, who works in uh, emergency also. And for Manny Valdivieso and Astrid, they are all medical personnel. They are all on the front line. Ask God to, to spare them. Ask by name for Brenda, Tiffany, Joyce, Claudine, Ray, Karen, Manny, and Astrid, and Angie. And don't forget.
Our closing litany comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And now receive the benediction. Unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry for the future. For I know what Jesus said, and today I walk beside him, for he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the golden stairs I climb. Every bird is getting brighter. Every cloud is silver light. There the sun is always shining. There are no tears within my eyes. At the ending of the rainbow, where the mountains touch the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know about tomorrow. It may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds me spare is the one who stands by me. And the path that is my portion may be through the flame or flood, but his presence goes before me, and I'm comfortable. Oh, many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know. I know who holds my hand. Yes, I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand.